All right. Now here at Word of Truth Baptist Church, we, uh, we tout being an old-fashioned church. We, we look to the old paths. We look to the ways that, that were the right ways and going really old. I mean, I'm not even talking about old, you know, old-fashioned in the sense of, you know, 1940s, 1950s America. I mean, old-fashioned going back to the old times of the Bible and the right ways that God has set forth for us to live and the standards that we need to have. And there's, um, there's an area that's lacking in our culture, in our society today, when you think about Christian and especially Christian men. We live in a backward society. We live in a society where, where the, the world is, is putting forth this notion that women need to be more masculine and that men need to be more feminine. And, and, and things are just getting twisted. It's just a perversion of Satan, you know, just, just trying to, to put on its end the way that God has established gender roles in the society. And what really is annoying, what's really irritating is, is seeing all of the effeminate, queer, namby-pamby, sissy little men out there that are, that are supposed to be this model for a Christian man. When the world puts out an image, or not even just the world, when Christianity, you know, I use that term real loosely, when these Christian churches are putting out what a Christian man is supposed to look like, it makes me sick. Yeah. It makes me sick to my stomach. I'm sick of these churches that want to make everybody believe that the Christian man is supposed to be this soft-spoken pushover, right? That, that never offends anybody, that let's just sit down and have a chat, that, that crosses his legs when he sits down, right? This, this little, not a man, half a man image. And look, it's not like all about image here, but, and it's not just an image for them, it's what they really are. And what we need is more real men, real Christian men. And we're going to be looking this morning at a lot of examples from the Bible. And this is one of the things that just stood out to me. You know, as I read the Bible, and as I'm looking at these men's lives, as I look at the prophets of the Lord, as I look at godly men and the way that they lived and their attitudes and the way that they worked and all the stuff they did for God, it's like non-existent today. You, you, you compare the Jeremiah's and the Moses and the Ezekiel's. And look, Moses was a man that was me, you know, more meek than like anyone on the earth, but he still ruled. Right. He still was a man that, that even though he was humble and he, was, he had humility, he was not a pushover. He didn't back down to Pharaoh one bit. And, and the way he led the children of Israel, he didn't back down to them either. He didn't, he didn't let them, you know, get, just get, get, he wasn't just some big pushover, some big softy, right? He called people out. He called, called them out on the carpet and said, you know what? Let God judge. Oh, you think you want to be here? You know, Dathan and Abiram, oh, you, you, you want to rule the people? You think that you're, you're qualified? Look, okay, let's bring it to the Lord. As the Lord opens up the, the earth and swallows them up into hell. And we're going to go through, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, different examples of men of God in the way, the things that they did that were godly, the things that they did that they're praised for, the, the, the actions that they, and, and the, the, the type of men that we need today. Being effeminate, this is why we started in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, being effeminate is a sin. Now the modern perversions of the God's word are going to tell you that this, um, in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, where it says, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Those last two terms, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, they'll say like a sodomite and a homosexual. As if they're like two different things. But still in the same sentence, basically just repeating itself in this list, which is ridiculous in and of itself. And I'm not going to get all into that. They're two different things. And I don't think, honestly, I don't think either of these is a sodomite. I don't believe that. I don't think either of these is what we consider a sodomite. But, um, and I'm, again, I'm not going to even get into, it's a whole other sermon, what abusers of themselves with mankind is, because I'm focusing on effeminate. That word's easy to understand, effeminate. And when it's used in the negative like this, it's not talking about women being effeminate, because being feminine for a woman is a good thing. That's exactly what you're supposed to be. When it's talking about being effeminate, that's talking about a man acting like a woman. Being effeminate, talking effeminate, talking like a, little, like a little girl. Acting like a girl instead of like a man. 
That's a sin. God made men and women different on purpose. And they're very different, and they have their own roles. And you know what? God loves and appreciates both of them separately, especially when they're doing their God-given roles. We all have different jobs to do. And as I was mentioning even earlier in the service today, with my job, I have a lot of work to do for this church. And being able to unload some of that and have people help me out with the roles, when people are in their roles and, and doing what they're doing, we get a lot more work done. Okay, My role is different than your role in this church, but everybody has a role. And a man's role and a woman's role, like in a marriage, they have different, completely different jobs to do. But they should be complementary one to the other so that you could get that much more accomplished. See, if you think that, well, it's a man's job and a woman's job to be bringing home the money and doing all the work and stuff, you're actually going to be losing out on doing even more with your lives because... When one person's able to focus on, on getting this job done, the other person can focus on getting a different job done. And when you're doing, especially the job that God has equipped you best for, is where you're going to be the most productive and where you're going to get the most stuff done. God has equipped men to be strong, to work, to be able to work hard, to go out and lead, and to, and to, and to do the things that, that he has established in his word. And women are equipped to be um, nurturers, keepers at home, you know, capable of multitasking, making sure all the things are taken care of at home while the man's off and doing his job. <clears throat> That's why the Bible says we need to give honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Men are supposed to be strong. God, not spo just supposed to, but are. They're so physically, God has made men stronger than women. That's just a fact. It is what it is. So there's people that want to, you know, promote the, this feminist concept, which is falsely called feminism, because nothing to do with women being feminine. It has to do with women being masculine. You should call it the masculist movement, because what you're trying to do is say women need to get stronger. Women need to play the same sports as men. Women need to do the same job as men. Women need to put on a hard hat. Women need to go out to battle and fight for this country. You know, it's ridiculous. You're trying to make women into men, and you call it that a feminist movement. It's doublespeak. It's propaganda. It's Satan pushing perversion on you. <clears throat> but the modern Christian man is portrayed as being weak. That's the way that, that, that modern Christianity is, is pushing forward what, what, a man, what a godly man is supposed to be. It's just this weakling. This soft-spoken, lispy-speaking, namby-pamby type of a man who, who doesn't stand for anything and, and is just a big pushover, a big softy. But what we're supposed to be as men is strong. We're supposed to be strong physically. We should be strong emotionally. And we should be strong spiritually. All aspects, there's strength. You're going to find strength being associated with being a man all throughout the Bible. And men being told to be strong and quit you like men. And, and that is what a man is supposed to be. So we're going to go through some of these attributes. First of all, just being physically strong. God doesn't want you. God made you a man. You're not supposed to be a weakling. Okay, now the Bible says that bodily exercise profiteth little. Okay, there's a little bit of profit to that. I'm not saying that we need to just get super buff and just super bodybuilder, extremely huge, you know, and that's where you spend all your time. But you ought to be able to do some w real work. I mean, you shouldn't let yourself get to the point to where you're just some weakling, some pushover, where you can't defend yourself, you can't defend your family. Because that's one of your responsibilities as a man, as a father, as a husband. To be able to protect your family. And you're not going to be able to do that if you're just if you're just have no strength whatsoever as a man. Turn if you would to Acts chapter 2. No, actually, turn if you would to Psalm 144. I'm going to read for you from Acts chapter 2. Physically tough. We're going to look at a couple examples. Because this is the least, probably the least important of the of the three being having strength and being strong, being physically tough, being emotionally tough. Strong and being spiritually strong. Physically, it's probably the, it's the least emphasized in the Bible, but it's still something that's there. It's still something that we're going to look at. And the first example is going to be King David. And what I want to point out here from Acts chapter 2 is that King David was referred to as a prophet. Yes, he was a king, but he also was a prophet. He also prophesied. He also was responsible for writing down about half the book of Psalms. He was instrumental in, in God's word being preached and him just espousing God's word and holding to God's word and being a Christian man. 
Acts 2.29 says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried in his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, David was a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to flesh, he would raise up Christ to his throne. It goes on and on and explains the psalm about Jesus Christ's soul dying, you know, being in hell for three days and three nights. His soul was not left in hell. Neither did his flesh see corruption. David prophesied that because he was a prophet, a man of God. And what are we talking about this morning? The men of God acting like little wimps and little sissies. So David was a man of God. You're in Psalm 144. Look at verse number one. Bible reads, Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. This prophet saying, you know what? God taught my hands how to war and my fingers how to fight. God was the one that was with David when he slew Goliath. God was the one that was with David when he killed the bear and the lion with his hands. God was the one that led him to victory in all of his battles. And yes, God gets all the credit. He gets all the glory. But you know what? David would not have been able to fight in those battles if he didn't have strength. If he didn't have some strength to be able to carry his sword and carry his armor and have some stamina to go out into these battles, it, you know, God gets the credit. But David still did the fighting. He still was out there doing the work. He still was the one, you know, that, that, that had, was strengthened in his arms and in his hands to do the work, to do the fighting. If you're just some weakling and you're not able to, to run, you don't have any stamina, you don't have any endurance, you're not going to be able to fight in a battle. David was a strong Warrior, He was a mighty man of valor. You look all throughout the Old Testament, you see these references to mighty men, men of valor, men of strength, men that had, you know, you think about the top 30 men and it goes into all their exploits and all the things they did and how they were able to, to slay, you know, 30 people coming at them. They were able to hold their ground and, and you know, all of the, the various war stories. By who? Strong men. Strong men of God. They were men of character. They had, you know, there was more than just their physical strength, obviously. But what I'm doing right here is just pointing out the physical strength that these men had. Another example is Jacob. You read about Jacob in, in the book of Genesis and how Jacob was, one, he was able to, to when he went and met Rebecca, when he was going off and to, to pay an Aram to, to find a wife and, uh, he, he ran into to Rebecca going out with the, with, her, with the flock and they're going to water the flock and they explained to Jacob that, well, they have to wait until a whole bunch of them get together before they could water the flock because the stone was real big and it was heavy and a bunch of them had to, to go and, and move it off. And what did Jacob do? He unrolled it himself. Which showed you right there he had some strength, but the other, another story that's in there that shows the physical strength of Jacob was when he was wrestling with God all night. I'll read this for you in Genesis 32. Turn, if you would, to, uh, to Job 38. Job 38. I'll read for you this story from Genesis 32 where that's real familiar. Jacob was wrestling in uh, verse 24. The Bible reads, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And again, I've mentioned this just recently in a sermon about fighting or wrestling, how much energy that takes to do in, in even just a short period of time. I mean, if you wrestle somebody like, like another, another man or someone that's like more equal to your strength, even 30 seconds, man, that feels like a lifetime. Yeah. It's tough. It's hard. And you only have to be, you know, you see guys wrestling and sometimes that way moving a lot. Even that is exhausting <laughs> when you're wrestling. You don't have to be when you're flexing and trying to, trying to get the upper hand and you're doing all that. It's exhausting. Jacob wrestled all night. All night he was wrestling. Verse 25 says, And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, the opponent, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. So Jacob's thigh goes out of joint, and he's still wrestling. He's still going forward. He doesn't give up when it gets tough. He keeps going. Why? Because he was strong, and he had endurance, and he was, he was strong not just physically, but also mentally to be able to keep going through the pain. Verse 26 says, And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. That was Jacob speaking. I'm not going to let you go. Not even giving up when the other guy's saying, All right, I'm done. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. There's a good thing to have power with God and with men. 
What was his power with men? He was able to, to wrestle. He had strength. He had physical strength. Being a godly man, you ought to have some physical strength. You ought to be able to do some things and be able to carry yourself and, like I said, be able to defend yourself. And the way that this story reads, it's like this guy just kind of came out of nowhere and started wrestling with Jacob, right? And uh, obviously there's a lot more to the story than just a wrestling match. But he was strong and he was able to do that. And you know what, you know what helps you get strong? It's not going to the gym. It's just working hard. When you have a job, when you have, you know, when, when you have things to do, just working hard. You know, I, even, I work at, a, at a, <laughs> in an office, at a desk, doing computer work. But I don't let myself just become a weakling. Why? Because I'm always doing other stuff at home. I'm all, you know, I've just been shoveling dirt and doing, you know, just doing all kinds of odd jobs that require physical strength just to keep the strength going. And because, I mean, I'm a man, you got to keep working. I mean, there's always work to do. There's always something to do. But you, it's, it's, you don't want to fall in this trap of just, just letting other people do it or not, not working hard and building your strength. But that's the, that's, like I said, that's probably the least important of what we're talking about with being a godly man. Physical strength, you should have it. But more importantly than that, let's get into the emotional strength. Because again, as a leader in the house, as a leader in, in your, you know, if, you, if you're married, you have a wife, you are to be a leader in that house and an example. And God created women with more emotion than he created men. And, and that's, that's a great thing. It's a, it's a great um, attribute to have for women. Because they are the ones that have been charged with raising children and keeping the house and being much more nurturing and sensitive to the needs and, and, and of children growing up. It's really important to have that emotion there and to have those attachments. And, and, and it's also important to be there to support your husband and, and to provide that emotional support that men pretty much don't ever even think about. It's important to have it. You realize when it's not there. But as a man... You don't really think about it too much when it is there. We ought to recognize it because it is important. But this is one of those roles that God has given unto women, being a help meet for the man. Man's got a lot, a lot of work to do. He's got a hard job and needs a helper and needs someone to be with him. That's the way that God has created us. But men are designed different. And we're not supposed to be like the ladies. We shouldn't just be sobbing and weeping and crying over every little thing or, you know, things that go wrong in a family or there's some fight or something. It shouldn't upset us the same way it upsets women. We're different. We're to be strong. Strength is a quality that is missing in godly men these days. You're in Job. Look at verse 38. Now, Job had a lot of things going wrong for him. It's understandable to see why Job was upset. And he's just been going through back and forth with his friends who were supposed to be there to comfort him and didn't comfort him at all. But look at how God speaks to Job. This is how God talks to him after everything that's happened. I mean, we all know the story, right? He lost all his children. He lost all his goods. He was sick. He had boils all over him. He was miserable. Miserable. Look at what God says in, in Job 38 verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. And he goes on and on and on on, on a lot of rhetorical questions that, that kind of put everybody in their place there that was listening, but he was answering Job. And he's saying, you know what? You know, pick up your pants. Gird up your loins like a man. He says, stand up. Get up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you. I want you to, to, to stand up like a man. Gird up your loins like a man. Jumped over the chapter 40, verse 6. He's going to say basically the same thing after he just goes on and on and on. He's like, where were you when I, you know, when I did all this great work? Where were you? you know, and um, kind of showing him how small he really is compared to God. But also, um, <clears throat> well, there's a lot of teaching. Let's look at Job 40, verse 6. Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up thy loins now like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. And he continues to talk to him there. This is the way that God treats Job and expects of him. He says, as a man, you need to gird up your loins like a man. There's a different expectation there. Otherwise, he wouldn't say, like a man. You need to toughen up. We need to be emotionally tough. We need to be able to go through the hard times and still be able to keep moving forward. 
and still be able to continue to work. We can't just stop and give up when things get tough. We need to be able to push ourselves and to keep going forward. Amen. That is a toughness that's required in a man because you know what? In a man in a household, you're the leader. Your wife might end up breaking down and not knowing what to do and, and giving up and your children aren't going to know what to do. But you as the man, as a leader, you need to be able to keep moving forward. You need to be able to gird up your loins like a man and just keep pushing and doing the work. Uh, turn, if you would, to Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7, we're going to see God dealing with Joshua in a similar manner. Now, when the children of Israel, when, when this is pretty early on, after Moses died and Joshua t carries the torch, and they're going into the, they're entering the promised land. And they've got a lot of battles to fight now because they're going to they're gonna be conquering all the people that are currently in the promised land. They got their first major victory, and then now they're headed to Ai. And at Ai, they suffer a loss. They suffer a defeat. They were all high and thinking everything's great, and like, man, you know, God's with us. Everything was going great, going strong. But what had happened was Achan had sinned. He took some spoil and he hid it in his tent. And God said, you're not supposed to take anything. The first battle, they were supposed to utterly just, just destroy everything and take nothing for yourselves. Everything went to God in that first battle. But what Achan did, he saw, he coveted, he took, and he hid it in his tent. And that brought, you know, that, that made God depart from them. God was not with them in their second battle at Ai. And they were defeated. So here we have Joshua. He got all discouraged because they lost. And he's just like, oh man, now what are we going to do? We lost this battle. And he's just like kind of throwing up his hands. Everything's, you know, what in the world is going to happen now? And, and falls on his face to God when they lose that battle. And we're going to see how God answers them. Look at J uh, Joshua chapter 7, verse number 6 reads, And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side, Jordan. So he's saying, God, why did you bring us over here just to destroy us? You know, like just a completely defeated attitude instead of, you know, looking at himself and saying, you know what, someone did something wrong here and deal with the problem. He's kind of just saying, oh man, I wish we could have just been content to stay over there and not have embarked on this big journey and just kind of giving up, right? Look at verse 8. O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their back before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, and shall environ us round, and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? So he's, now he's just worried that everyone's going to hear that they lost, and just surround them and kill them. But God answers them. Look at verse 10. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Hey, get up. What are you doing laying on the ground? Stand up. Get up. What are you thinking? Verse number 11. Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel cannot stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up! Sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee. O Israel, thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. Again, we see a similar situation to Job, not exactly the same, but Joshua should have known. He'd been through all of those years in the wilderness. He'd been through so much, and he should realize to have the faith in God. And look, when God says something, he's going to follow through with it. So he should have put two and two together and say, you know what, if God wasn't with us, there's a reason for it. We don't just need to just fall on our face and throw up our hands and say, I don't know what I'm going to do. He should have been able to figure out, hey, someone sinned. Someone did something that God told us not to do in this last battle because he was with us then. He's not with us now. What happened? And he could have figured it out and kept moving forward and said, now look, I don't want to be too tough on Joshua, right? I mean, I, I, 
I can't say that I would do any different. I'm not saying I'm any better than Joshua, but it's easy to look at this Bible and, and see from God's Word what we need to learn and what we could learn from Him. And as a man, God's treating him, telling him, look, stand up. Get up off your face. What are you doing? And this is a way that, that men need to be able to, to be dealt with. Is get up. Keep working. Keep moving. You know, do what's right. And don't just, just stop and throw up your hands. Men are expected to just be able to deal with things. Bad things come your way, deal with it. Keep moving forward. Don't let it discourage you and don't let it stop you. We aren't supposed to be crying and complaining about how things are work, aren't working out in our life. Oh, God, what are we going to do? Now they're all just going to come and destroy us. Get up. Keep fighting. Fight the good fight. Contend for the faith. We're supposed to have strength physically, emotionally, and spiritually. When things aren't going right, you got to get up and do something about it. Don't just sit around and cry about it. This is a mentality that men need to have. This is an old-fashioned mentality. This is something the way that, that men that used to be real men would behave and act. It's a toughness that, that, that God has designed men to have. And that we need to also make sure that we're working for it also. Because, you know, strength, physical strength doesn't happen overnight. You've got to work at it, right? You've got to keep doing work. You've got to work. Whatever it is that you're doing, the strength gets built over time. I, mean, I remember being a, a, you know, a teenager. I bet even though I was in probably way better shape in my younger years, in my high school days, you know, when, when I was in all the sports and everything else. As almost a 40-year-old man right now, I could probably kick my old butt that was back in high school just because of the strength that's been accumulated when you become a man. And, you know, I don't care how much I was doing back then. There's strength that you build up by working over time. It doesn't happen overnight. And... Um, it's the same thing with the, the emotional toughness and the spiritual toughness as well. Now turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to see a lot of examples here of great men of God that did some things that were tough, that were hard. And I put this in a category of spiritual toughness. It could also be thought of as mental toughness because they're, they're real similar. It's almost the same thing. It's, it's things that you have to do that are right, that are not necessarily easy. There are things that you have to do that are right that might be unpleasant. There's things that you have to do that are the right thing to do that you have to be tough about that maybe a lot of people aren't going to like. But they're right in the eyes of the Lord. Keep this in mind now as we read this brief story in 1 Samuel 15. Compare that to the Rick Warrens or the Joel Osteens as a man of God. Samuel is a priest. He's a man of God. Look at what Samuel did here in 1 Samuel 15. Look at, uh, we're going to start reading verse number 31. The Bible reads, So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delic delicately, and Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And before we read verse 33, this is when Saul was commanded and ordered to wipe out the Amalekites. He was ordered to just, just completely destroy them all. But he didn't. They brought back some of the spoil. They brought back some of the, the animals and stuff to offer, you know, supposedly to offer up as a, as a gift to, to the Lord. And he also brought back the king alive instead of killing him on the battlefield like he was commanded to do. He brought him back alive. So Samuel has to set everything straight. Verse 33, it says, And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. That means he chopped him up. It's easy to read that, but think about that. He killed him with his sword and literally cut a human body into pieces. And that was the right thing to do under the commandment of the Lord. That's not a pleasant thing to do. I don't think Samuel was just taking some kind of pleasure in hacking somebody up. But he did what needed to be done. He did something that was tough. He did something that was hard to do that Saul didn't do. But as a man of God, he took it upon himself. 
And he was capable of doing that too. Let's look at our next example, 1 Kings chapter 18. One of my favorite stories in the Bible. 1 Kings chapter 18 is the story of Elijah. When he felt like he was all alone, and there's all these other prophets of Baal, and they're going to determine once and for all who the real God is. And they go for, he's like, okay, you're going to offer up a sacrifice, but you can't put any fire under it. Your God has to, has to take care of that for you. And they're, you know, all the prophets of Baal out there, they're cutting themselves. They're calling out to God. They're doing all their hocus pocus and all the things that they think that they could do to get God to answer. But they worship a false God who is no God at all. So obviously, if there's no God, there's no God to answer. Right? And Elijah's mocking him. Elijah's, you know, oh, yeah, call on your God. Oh, maybe he's out on a long journey. Maybe he's away from home. You know, maybe he can't hear you. Maybe he's sleeping. I don't know. Call a little bit louder. I love that story. It's a great story. But then, of course, Elijah digs the trench, sets up the altar, okay, douse it with water, fill a pool around it. Look, completely drenched in water. You know what? God's going to burn up this sacrifice. That's exactly what he did. Licked up all the water around it. God answered by fire. Proving that the, you know, the Lord is the God. And look at what happens here in verse number 38 of 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18, verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. Look at verse 40. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Elijah literally killed these prophets of Baal. Now look, I'm not saying today that men of God are going to go around and start killing all of these you know, false prophets that are out there and these worshipers of Baal. That's not what I'm teaching. I'm teaching the toughness that they had to do something like that. I'm teaching that they had the ability to do something that might be unpleasant. That might be unpopular, but it's what God had wanted them to do. And this was one of the commandments of the Lord is when someone goes and tries to make you worship another God that you've not known, the death penalty is supposed to be on that person in God's law. Okay? We don't operate under God's law today, unfortunately, but this was right. This was the right thing to do. And he did what was right because he had the toughness to do what's right. And when you read about these people and you think about these people, people overall are still people and haven't changed. They're still the same lusts of the flesh. They're still the same spirit of God. They're still, you know, people have over time are still people. Our environments change. Cultures change. But the feelings you have, the emotions you have, the, the struggles that you have are relatively the same. And you can't look at another time, oh, it must have been really easy for him to do that. It was not easy for Elijah to do any of these things. He was alone. He didn't have the strength of a whole bunch of other people that were like-minded to be able to be edified from one another. He stood alone for the Lord. Amen. I mean, he really put his neck out there on the line and just did what he thought was right. He completely thought, he was, I mean, and after this great victory, he's ready to die. He's just like, where is every, you know, like, I thought this was going to be the great revival. And they're after my life again. He stood out there as a strong man of God, as Samuel did. Turn, if you would, to Numbers 25. Numbers 25. We're going to see Phinehas. Son of Aaron, the priest. Numbers 25. There was an event that happened where the, the children of Israel had commit, were committing fornication in Baal Peor with these, with these other women, with these heathen women. And, and it was a sin unto them, and God was cursing them for it. And, and we're going to read this story. How Phinehas basically stops the wrath of the Lord from consuming the children of Israel for doing something that was difficult to do but is righteous. Look at verse number 3. 
The Bible reads, And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. So he's telling Moses, Take all the heads of the people, you know, the, the people in charge, take all the people that are in positions of authority, all the heads, and hang them up before the Lord against the sun. They all need to be put to death because they were not making sure that the people aren't getting involved in, in the trouble like they're supposed to be doing. It says in verse 5, And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one as men that were joined in Baal Peor. So Moses is just right there saying, All right, let's do it. This is what God commanded. That's not popular. Kill your brethren. But it needed to be done. It was God's will. That's what God said to do. Look at verse 6. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses. So here's a guy that's really bold, completely emboldened in his sin and just comes right out with it for everybody to see. He's got this Midianitish woman, this heathen woman. And this is what God was angry about to begin with is that they're committing fornication with these women and he just comes right out, him and his Midianitish woman, right, right in the sight of Moses. As Moses is trying to deal with this problem, he just walks right out there like, what are you going to do? And in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, verse 7, and when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he sees this and he's like, what are you thinking? He rose up from among the congregation, took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly, so the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. He says, you know, the, the audacity, the gall to be able to show up in the midst of the congregation when God is cursing us for this, for this sin, you just come right up and just flaunt it right out in the open. And Phineas says, says, no way. I'm going to solve this problem right now. And he picks up a javelin and he kills him. And you think, oh, but God didn't want him to do that. I mean, he just did that out of anger, out of rage, right? No, let's see what God does about that. What God says about that. Verse number 9, And those that died in the plague were 24,000. 24,000 people had died up to this point because God was plaguing them for this sin. 24,000 people. That's a lot of people dying as a result of this sin. Yeah. Verse number 10, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, now we need to, he needs to be put to death because he shouldn't have killed that guy. Oh, wait, no, that's not what he says. Let's see what he says. Hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake among them that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore, say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. That one tough act, that one act of having to, to do something, you know, bloody, that's gory, that's, that's not pleasant. I mean, it's not, I, I've never taken another person's life, but I can't imagine that it's something that you'd ever want to do. I know it's not something I ever want to do. It's not a pleasant experience, but he did it. And as a result of that action, he says, I'm giving him a covenant of peace, which is a great thing. Obviously, we want to have peace. By him doing that, it says, and he shall have it and his seed after him, verse 13, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. Look at verse 14. Now we're going to see a little bit more insight into this event. Now the name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianite woman, was Zimri, the son of Salu, a prince of a chief house among the Simeonites. So again, already one of the people that was supposed to have been slain because he was a ruler. He was one of the people that was ahead of the, of the children of Israel. And verse 15 says, In the name of the Midianite woman that was slain was caused by the daughter of Zer, he was head over a people and of a chief house in Midian. These were high-ranking people that he went and killed. That takes a little bit extra nerve and a little bit extra guts to go and do something like that because these are people that would actually have a way of, of you know, maybe punishing you because they're the, in, in a higher position of authority. And he said, it doesn't matter to him. He said, that, that, this needs to be fixed. This is a problem. This is something that needs to be addressed and addressed in the way that God had said for it to be done. 
And let me reiterate, you know, I'm not saying to just take up arms and to kill people. But in order to do these things, you have to be strong. You have to be spiritually strong. You have to be mentally strong and understand this is the will of the Lord. It might require me making some difficult decisions. It might require me doing something that is not easy to do, but I'm going to do it anyways because it's right. Because I'm a man, I'm a man of God, and I'm going to be strong about this. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to look at a few more attributes of being a godly man today as opposed to what the world is putting out there, what modern Christianity is putting out there. Besides the strength, besides the, the physical, emotional, and, and mental strength or spiritual strength, we also have a lot of people who are, who are too worried about offending people, right? The modern Christian man is out there saying, oh, don't offend anybody. Right? Don't say anything that, that might turn people away. We want to have just, just fill up this place with, with people. And if you're going to say something offensive, then don't say it at all because you don't want someone to actually like leave. You want them just to stay here. The problem with that attitude is that if you're going to preach something that's in God's word that people get offended at and you decide not to preach that because you don't want them to leave, now you're judging God's word. Now you're the one who's deciding that, oh, well, if I preach this truth, this part of God's word that he gave unto us, that he wanted us to have, then it's going to make people leave, so I better not say that. You, are, you have become a judge over God's word. You have now placed yourself as if your understanding is greater than that of God's. But that's what's happening today. People don't want to teach on, you know, divorce and remarriage being a sin and being wrong. And if you get divorced, you know, you can't get remarried. They don't want to teach on that. Why? Because half the people in America are divorced. And why is that even happening? Because preachers were afraid to preach on it decades ago. And they're still, they're even more afraid to preach on it now that there's more people divorced. They don't want people turning around and, and leaving the church. But it's God's word. It's going to just continue to get worse if you don't preach on it. You can't worry about the, the one or two people or, or five or ten or a hundred or a thousand people that get offended and leave when you're preaching the word of God. Amen. The commandment he gave unto Jeremiah, the commandment he gave unto Ezekiel, it says don't worry about the look on their faces. Don't worry about what they're going to say. Don't worry about what they're going to do. Your job is to preach the word of God. Stamp with the foot. Raise up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their sin. Show them the law. Show them the way to live a righteous life and let the chips fall where they may. It's God's word. Now, it's not a goal to set out and offend people, but God's word is divisive. God's word can be offensive to some. It shouldn't be, but it is. And I can't control whether or not you're going to get offended over God's word. My job is to preach it. And your job is to preach it also. Your job is to believe it and preach it as well. Modern Christian man, though, is too worried about offending people. I mean, it's really just a lack of salt. You know, we're supposed to be the salt of the earth. We're supposed to be able to preserve things. Sarah, sit down in your chair. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verse number 1. We're going to see here an example of John the Baptist, who is another great godly man. Matthew chapter 3, verse number 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Excuse me, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Here's a man for you. He's out in the wilderness. He's out in the woods. He's got a raiment. Well, I mean, here is probably more of a desert, but regardless, he's wearing camel's hair as, 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 his, as his clothing, right? It's camel skin. He's got a leather belt. And he's out there eating locusts and just wild honey and just totally living off the land. I mean, this is the, the picture of John the Baptist. And John, you know, Jesus said that um, you know, among them that are born of women, there's not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. We're talking about a great man of God. I mean, here's someone who really did a lot for the work of God. And this is what he looked like. This is who he was. Uh, flip over to um, Mark chapter 6. 
Not only was John, you know, he, he had to have been tough. He was living off the land. He was living out in the wilderness. He was eating locusts and wild honey. Which, he wasn't delicately appareled, right? You know, Jesus said, well, what, what, went for, what, what went you out for to see? You know, a reed shaking in the wind? Because these guys were around during Jesus' time too. What, do you expect to see one of these guys that's just, that's just a pushover? That's just real nammy pammy. What were you out for to see? What were you went out in the wilderness to see? He's talking about John the Baptist. What, what were you thinking? What did you expect to see out there? You know, he's like, you know, those that are delicately apparelled, you know, in their king's houses, right? He's not, he, he's, he's a hands-on guy. He's a real man. He's a real man of God. He's preparing the way of the Lord. He's preaching the truth. He's telling people you need to repent. He's telling people, you know, you need to change. You need to think differently about what you're doing. Repent. Nobody likes to hear, wait, I got to do something different. Oh, wait, I'm wrong. Oh, wait, yo, because if you're doing everything right, there's no need to repent of anything. Right? But his message was, you're doing it wrong. You need to change. You need to change something. Look at Mark chapter 6, verse 17. We're going to see what got John the Baptist in trouble because he had the, not just the physical toughness, he had the mental toughness. He had the spiritual toughness to say what needed to be said to teach what needed to be taught. Mark 6, verse 17 says, For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. He said that unto the ruler of the people at the time, unto the governor, saying, You can't have her to wife. That's against God's law. That's a sin. That's wickedness. He wasn't afraid to speak up. He wasn't a respecter of persons. God's word was being preached and being taught regardless of who, of who was hearing him. He didn't change his message. He didn't tone it down. Thus saith the Lord. That applies to you, Herod. I don't care how proud you are. I don't care how highly you think of yourself and that God's laws don't apply to you. Yes, they do. And it's interesting how, how it really irritates people that are in sin to hear about that. I mean, it, it, it bothered his wife so bad, the illegitimate wife, that she was the one that had him beheaded. She had it out for him. Herod himself didn't even care. You know, he's just like, yeah, whatever. Right? He still enjoyed hearing from him and he knew that he shouldn't touch him because the guy's a righteous man. And he, he really wasn't that willing to, to shed the innocent blood. But because he wasn't a man of character either, when, when, the, when the daughter danced and, and asked for the head of John the Baptist, he's just like, oh, well, I, I got to do this. Instead of saying, no, actually, this is something I'm not going to do. And having a backbone, he just, just did it. He has no integrity. But, uh, but that's the type of man that John the Baptist was. He wasn't afraid of that. He wasn't afraid of offending people. He wasn't afraid of offending the governor or the ruler. God's word is God's word. Look at John chapter 6. We're going to see an attitude that Jesus had also about offending people. And as I mentioned, we're not out with the goal of offending people. But when God's word offends, then God's word offends. Amen. And we're not going to withhold that. John chapter 6, look at uh, verse number 61. Verse number 61. This is, this is the chapter where Jesus is saying that he's the bread of life and except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you know, you have no part. So they're just like, whoa, you know, kind of blown away. That's, you know, what are you talking about? A lot of people just, this is a hard saying. Okay. And look at what Jesus' answer was. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, let me rephrase that. Let me change that a little. Don't wait, wait, don't go. Wait, I want... Uh, let, let me just... No, I didn't mean it. I, I, oh, I misspoke. Oh, oh, that's not what the Bible says. Here, let's read what the Bible says. Look at verse number 61. I'm sorry, I just keep on getting confused with the, with the Scripture. Verse number 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. From that time, 
Many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Because of what he said, because of what he preached, because of the truths that he preached, a lot of his disciples went back. And this is his disciples. I mean, this isn't the apostles. This isn't the 12. But a lot of his other disciples, people who had been following Jesus in his ministry for a little while, they started following him. They're just like, okay, yeah, we're quitting now. Backing out of that. They went back. And did Jesus run after them and say, wait, don't go. You just didn't understand me. That wasn't the attitude he had at all. Look at what he answered then. He says, then said Jesus to the 12, to his closest and best friends and disciples and the apostles, will you go also? You also going to go? Go ahead. You going to stick with me? You going to hear what I have to say? Or are you just going to go too? Is this too hard for you? Is this too tough? Can't handle it? Go ahead. Christian men of God need to be looking at the examples of great men of God that we have in the Bible, especially having I mean, Jesus Christ. You don't get any better than that. He wasn't falling all over himself or apologizing for what he said. He preached the truth. He preached what needed to be said. It's their problem if they can't accept it. If they can't handle it, that's their problem. That's not your problem. And again, it doesn't mean you have to make, you know, make the Bible into more than what it says. It doesn't mean you have to try to sensationalize the Bible or, or make things sound different than the way that it's coming across in Scripture. But the truth is the truth. God's word is God's word. And you know, a lot of times people get so caught up in trying to make things palatable from the Bible that you just completely lose the, the, the strength of God's word. It says what it says. There's no easy way to tell people that are divorced, that are not remarried yet, that it's a sin and that God's word says you shouldn't do. There's not an easy way of saying that. I mean, you just quote the verses to them. It's up to them to accept that. And that's one example. There's plenty of examples. It's, 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 there's no easy way to tell the person that has a sodomite as a relative that that person's a reprobate. But that's what the Bible says. That's what Scripture says. That's the truth. It's not an easy way to, to, to give the message, so you just got to give the message. And warn people, watch out for that person. Don't leave your kids alone with that person because they're a predator. Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 18. We're almost done. The other problem with the, with the way that, that Christian men are portrayed these days is the way that the modern Christian man has to run everything by his wife. Has to just, just get permission, make sure everything's okay at home with the wife before you make any decisions. Well, wait, I can't, I can't commit to that. I don't know. Let me go ask my wife. Let me make sure that she's okay with it. Making her the boss, making her the head of the household instead of you being able to make decisions as a man in the family. Look at Genesis 18. We're going to see an example here with Abraham and Sarah. Now, a lot of people will misconstrue what we teach and what we believe being old-fashioned fundamentalists about, the, about the, the, the head of the household being the man. Okay, You don't have to be a jerk when you rule your household. You don't have to treat your wife as if she's subhuman or as if she's you know, an animal. Okay? That's wrong. That's bad. But, but that being said, as the ruler, as the head of the household, you are in charge. And what you say is what goes in the household by the authority of God. Read Ephesians chapter 5. Read Colossians chapter 3. You'll see the roles that were given to men and to women, to husbands and to wives. And this is important for the wives to hear as much as for the husbands. Okay? 
Because women need to be in a submissive role and understanding that their husband is the boss and men need to understand that you're the boss. And you need to fill your role also. You're going to make it a lot harder for your wife to be submissive. Actually, you might not think it is, but you're going to make it harder on your wife if you're going to try to be used entreaties on your wife on how you rule the house. It's not going to work. You, you, for, you might want to think it works better somehow in your head. It's not going to work better. Your, 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 spot, your wife is going to have a harder time submitting to your authority when you don't really have that authority. We're not really using your authority. You're just kind of saying, well, is this okay? Well, how about this? And getting permission and getting approval. Now, there's nothing wrong when you make a decision to, to understand the things that your wife likes. If you want to please your wife, if you want your wife to be happy, those are great things. Husbands ought to love their wives and care for them and, and, and want them to be happy and, and, and you know, be able to, to, to do things for them and by asking them things and knowing what pleases them and making decisions based on some of that. That's great. That's fine. But what I'm talking about is when you just run everything by your wife. Like, is this okay? Is this okay? Well, we're going to do this. Well, we're, you know, what are we going to do with the kids? What are we going to do here? And you just run everything. You don't have to do that. You can ask for, for opinion, but it's different than asking for permission. Genesis 18, we're going to see a godly example here of a husband and wife with Abraham and Sarah. Look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord... If now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. Now, here Abraham sees these men traveling. And he says, you know what? I'm going to help these guys out. Come on in. He's being real hospitable. Come on in. Sit down. I'll make you some food. I'll give you some water. You can wash your feet and you can continue on your way. And this is the way Abraham, he didn't say, well, wait a minute. Before I invite them over to my house, I'm going to go ask my wife and make sure it's okay. I'm going to go see if she's going to be okay with having people over. That's not what he did. He saw them. He acted and he said, this is the right thing to do. This is what I'm going to do. And it says, come for your hearts here. In verse 5, kind of in the middle, after that you shall pass on. For therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. And here's how he deals with it. Verse 6, and Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. He was given a commandment to his wife. He didn't go around saying, well, honey, if you have the time, you know, whenever you're available, can you just maybe fit this in and do this? He, just, he, he wasn't mean about it, right? There's nothing mean or being a jerk about this. He's just saying, look, make ready quickly three, me three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. I need you to do this. We've got people here, and we're taking care of them. And she didn't say, oh, man, what are you doing having people over? I got so many things to do already. Don't you know my workload? Don't you know everything I got going on? And now you want me to make food for visitors? That's not the way that the wife responded. Sarah did it. Jump down to verse 18. Because what they were doing, this is the two angels. And what I believe is Jesus Christ going down to Sodom. And they were going to destroy Sodom. So this is what's happening in the story. And God's kind of questioning here whether or not he's going to tell Abraham what he's about to do. You know, should, I, should I let him know what's going to happen? And, and he gives a great compliment here to Abraham and how Abraham was a great father, a great husband, and a great leader. Look at verse number 18. The Bible reads, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. God says, I know Abraham. I know he's going to command his children. He teaches and it says, his children and his household after him. Everyone in his house. Abraham was the ruler. He was the leader. He was setting the example, and he was also commanding. 
This is what you're going to do. There's no doubt about it. This is the path that you are on. You are going to live a righteous life. And that is the way that he dictated it. And he's a great example of a godly man. And God says, I know him. He's going to teach his children. He's going to teach his household. And he's going to run them in the right path. He is doing his job greatly. And he had a, a, a great wife also. Jump back here to verse number 10 because this is where we get the promise of Abraham receiving because at this point Isaac has not been born. And he receives this promise that he's going to have a son in his old age. He's 99 years old. In his old age, he's receiving this promise. Now you're going to have a son. And Sarah hears that promise. Look at verse number 10. And we're going to see here a little bit about the righteousness of Sarah and how godly she is, and more scriptural support for the man being the head of the household and being the ruler of the house. Look at verse number 10. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. At this point, Sarah had already gone through menopause. I mean, she'd already just, just, she's not physically capable of having children. So she hears this and it's like, <laughs> I'm old. You know, I, there's no way I could have children again. But it's a promise from God, right? So it's, a, it's another miracle. It's a miraculous event. But look at verse number 12. Therefore, so because of this, because Sarah's already old, she, you know, she's not capable of having children anymore. It says, therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And, you know, she's rebuked for this and told, you know what? No, this is going to happen. You're going to have a child. But look at what it says. It says she laughed within herself. She was hearing what's going on. She wasn't out there saying, no way, that's not going to happen. She was just, she was listening to the conversation. She laughed within herself. She was amused by that, thinking that, is this really going to happen now that I'm 90 years old? And it said, look at what she says. She says, after I'm waxed old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord being old also. She called Abraham her Lord. And in her heart, that's what she was thinking. She wasn't saying this out loud to, to, to show herself to be some righteous woman in front of people, in front of the visitors, in front of the guests. This is the way she felt. She viewed Abraham as her Lord, as her boss, as someone that she was submissive to. That was in her heart. And going, turn if you would to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to see here how that is a great attribute and a great quality which is commended in the New Testament in first chapter in first Peter chapter number three because this story is referred to as that being a great thing about Sarah first Peter chapter three all the way near the end of the Bible first Peter chapter three verse number one the Bible reads likewise ye wives be in subjection to your own husband. See, we're going to see, there's some more scriptural evidence of the man being the head of the household and the difference uh, in the roles of the, the husband and wife. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. This is the only reference that we saw in Genesis 18 of Sarah actually calling Abraham Lord. It was when she called him Lord in her heart. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. This is the old-fashioned path that we're talking about. These are the old-fashioned values that we're looking to. Going all the way back to Abraham and Sarah. As a husband and a wife, the role models, the old-fashioned values they had. 
The wife was submissive. The, the husband was in charge. He was a leader, and he gave honor unto the, woman, unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. He treated Sarah great. Sarah loved them. They loved each other. They treated each other very well. But Abraham was in charge, and Sarah was not. He didn't have to run everything by his wife. He didn't have to check with her and make sure everything was okay. He made decisions, as the man in the house ought to be able to do. Not ought to be able to. You are able to. Don't, don't ever think, oh, I can't do that. Oh, well, I've been living this way for so long. Change. Repent. Get right now. <clears throat> There's a lot of ways as men that we need to be strong. We need to be not worried about offending people. We need to be rulers and leaders in our house. We need to be men that the Bible says is, is an old-fashioned type of a man of God. <clears throat> Don't worry about what the world thinks. The world's going to think you're crazy anyways. Yeah. When you believe the Bible, there's going to be things that you believe that everyone's going to think you're nuts. You know, you're going to be getting looks. You're going to be, you know, people are going to be whispering about you at the family gatherings. People are going to be talking behind your back. Whatever. Because do you care more about what they say or do you care more about what God thinks? I care about God. I want to please Him. And you know what? I want to have the most successful marriage that I could have. I'm going to fill my role that is laid out in the Bible. And wives, if you want to have the most successful marriage, the most happy marriage, the most blessed marriage, fulfill your role. You can't make the other person fulfill their role. But you know what? You can hinder the other person from fulfilling their role as a husband if you are trying to always ask, you know, you're giving up your authority to the wife. That's going to hinder things. That's not going to help your relationship at all. And when the wives try to usurp that authority, again, it's not going to help at all. It's going to hinder the relationship. Even though you think, well, no, I could do things better. I'm smarter. I'm more spiritual. Whatever the case may be, it's, you're not going to be in, in the Lord's will. It's not going to be the best thing for your marriage. Let's bow right and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great instruction that you give us in your word. We thank you for these great men of God that we can look to for examples. God, help us to, to be tough as men. Help us to be able to have the strength that we need to, to do the unpopular things, to do the things that are, that are um, difficult to do, that maybe we don't even want to do ourselves, but that we will do to serve you. Even as Jesus Christ, the greatest example of a godly man that, that didn't want to have to go to the cross to suffer that, the, the shame and to suffer the torture and, and, and everything else that he had to go through, but he was still willing to do it. And he still did do it. He says, not my will, but thine be done. He had the strength. He had the toughness to do that, dear Lord. Help us to have a similar strength as men, dear God. Help us to be able to just do whatever it is that you have for us to do and to be able to get up and to gird our loins like a man and to keep working. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.